Hello everybody, welcome along to another episode of Nurse Recruitment Secrets. This is the leading webinar and podcast series on improving your nurse recruitment and retention for the benefit of your hospital system, your healthcare provider, and most importantly, nurses. So today I'm excited because we've got another heavyweight guest, um, Dr. By an Antrim from Cone Health. So I was scrolling on LinkedIn, as you do, and saw an interview that Vi did. And in it, she spoke about how she cut premium labor by 40% to achieve a $100 million financial turnaround for Cone Health. Now, I wanted to dig into that and find out how she did it. And what's that all about so here's the background most hospitals have accepted that extortionate labor costs and depressed margins are here to stay but dr vi thinks otherwise in collaboration with other executives she contributed to a 100 million dollar financial turnaround in Cohen's 2023 fiscal year her achievements include a reduction in premier labor costs of 48 percent and we'll dig into what that means in this podcast and also shift incentives by working um, by almost 50% by working with a cross-functional team. So let's jump into it. How are you doing today, Vi? I'm doing great and I'm happy to be here, Adam. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to share what we've done at Cone Health. Absolutely. So first of all, I'm curious to know, so you, what's your career trajectory? So let us, like, when did you start as a nurse and then how did you move into CNO and get your doctorate? Yeah, so um, I started out in accounting because I thought math, computers, and money, I like all of those. But sometimes the Lord has different plans for you than you have for yourself. And so I actually went into nursing as a second career. And truly, I have loved every step along the way. So I worked as an uncertified aide when I was going to nursing school, got my LPN partway through, worked as an RN and really just kind of came up the ranks in nursing. So I've done all the things um, and spent the first 11 years of my career in clinical practice before moving into leadership. And the reason I went into leadership was not because, I didn't leave the bedside because I didn't love the bedside. Like I loved the bedside but I wanted to be able to do more for more people. And so the way to do that is through leadership. I found I love the patients, the people who come with the patients and the people who take care of the patients. And so leadership was just a natural foray for me into that. So um, that's kind of how I got to where I am today, yeah. just kind of going right on up the ranks. And how did you make the move into leadership? Uh, actually, you know, a lot of my career, I was tapped um, to go into it. But when I was getting ready to graduate with my bachelor's degree, I wanted to move into a charge nurse position in the hospital where I was at. They had dedicated charge nurses. So that was really my first step into leadership. And then uh, some of the, they called them nursing care coordinators or nursing supervisors or administrative coordinators. I've seen them called lots of different names. Um, but some of my nursing care coordinators uh, said, you know, Vi, would you ever want to do this job? And so I said, you know, I do think I would like to do that job. And so that got me into being able to provide coverage to the entire hospital on the off shifts. I worked primarily nights and uh, it was a big level one trauma center. So 607 beds. Um, mm. So it's not small. And within that trauma center, they also had eight inpatient psychiatric units. You had your ED proper for medical. You had a 52 bed psychiatric ED. So, um, you know, from there, when people see what you can do, they see that potential, you know, then I've just had people tap me and say, hey, would you be willing to come do this? Would you be willing to come do that? Um, so a lot of my career 
has been people tapping me on the shoulder to say, hey, I could really use you here. Um, and of course, the whole time, because when I saw that I was being tapped for those leadership roles, I continued to pursue my education and get involved in professional organizations. Um, when I was a manager over dialysis and uh, a couple of hybrid ORs, the chief operating officer at that facility said, hey, I want to bring you to a board meeting with me. He was the regent for uh, that section of New York for the American College of Healthcare Executives. And so I already had um, joined that organization previously and was a fellow. And when he brought me there um, in my second meeting, I was co-chairing the program committee. And so I got to meet a lot of executives all across the region where I was. So I got very comfortable being in front of executives fairly early in my career, which I think was a good thing to have happen. I, you know, I really got to interact with them, learn some of the norms and see how people interact. What are the things that they're thinking about so that I could go learn more about those things. So I always did my own professional development plan every year. Yeah. And that also was helpful. So ACHE is a big part of my career too. Okay. Yeah, because I know some nurses listen to this and uh, a lot are ambitious. It's great to hear how you did that and put your your best foot forward. And I think that's one of the benefits of working in a big trauma center as well. There's lots of opportunities. So let's jump into Cone Health. I'd like to first get you to take us back to 2021, 2022, kind of pandemic times. And how did the the situation for needing to make financial change come to be? What were some of the things that you were overspending on as an organization, some of the, the financial stresses? Yeah, so we lost 900 nurses during COVID out of a pool of about 3,500 that work in our acute care setting. So we lost 900 to travel nursing predominantly. Um, because of how high the rates were and things like that. Um, and then the other thing that we saw was people dropping their FTE status. So instead of working full time, they were like, I want to go per diem. So they would have more control over their schedule, but people were dropping to per diem with us and then taking a travel assignment because they didn't want to leave permanently you know, they knew the money would dry up sooner or later, but that really caused us to spend uh, enormous amounts of money to fill our staffing gaps. Um, as you know, the, the staffing agencies greatly hiked their prices during COVID and, um, and it was not a sustainable model for any organization. You can't pay those kind of premiums. And in addition, not only were the travel nurse rates high, but then there was fierce competition for the nurses who were left. So all of the organizations were using shift incentives because you're trying to make sure you have enough people to take care of the patients who are in your facility. Um, and of course, we put safety in the center of everything, safety for our patients, safety for our staff. And so during COVID, um, you know, we reduced the ratios for nurses who were working with COVID patients because of all of the donning and doffing requirements. We had to create new roles for observers so that we made sure that people were safe putting their PPE on and off. And if they forgot a step, someone was right there to walk them through that process. So, um, those were some of the things that really led to that, um, to a need to really create sort of a, a turnaround plan for us. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's just in the nursing realm. That isn't even some of the other areas, but yeah, that's really what caused it for us. Yeah, it was like a meteor shower almost, the pandemic just kept, 
getting hit by like successful problems. So the supply and demand nurses all change quite differently, like quite quite largely, and spending a lot more on a pool that everybody wants. So I'd love to get into the turnaround and find out a little bit more about your approach to revenue growth and cost reduction. Can you tell yeah. us more about that? Absolutely. So during COVID, um, we took our recently vacated women's hospital because that moved to a brand new tower just in the nick of time. Uh, and we created a, a COVID-19 only hospital. So that was immediately 120 additional beds that we hadn't been really using in our system that we had during COVID. Um, so, so I just say that some of the growth that we experienced was just that. But other things, you know, over the course of fiscal year 23, you know, we were growing our imaging volumes. We were adding inpatient capacity because more people were coming to see us. So we had to add additional staff to inpatient capacity to accommodate that. We're growing some of our outpatient sites, adding urgent cares and things like that. And so some of the ways that we really tackled this, you know, I thought about what are ways that we can attract nurses back to Kona Health. Uh, we're grateful for travel nurses, for sure. When you need them, you need them and you're glad that they're there. But I think every organization's preference would be to have their own nurses who are familiar with their policies and protocols. We created a system-wide premium flex pool and put about 220 nurses into that system-wide premium flex pool at, a, at an enhanced rate. And then also we thought about our staff who were here and how was that going to feel with them working alongside of those people. And so we put some stringent requirements in place with those roles. So while they were making a lot more money, they never knew where they were going to be from schedule to schedule because we would move them around within their area of competency. They had to be experienced with at least two years. Um, they had to work every other weekend, which is not a requirement for most of our staff. They had to work four of the six major holidays a year. And so that really um, helped us sell it to our own nurses who are going to be working side by side with them. Because one of the things we heard during COVID is travelers were taking off during the holidays. Um, and then our staff was having to cover it. And it really created some bitter feelings for our staff. <laughs> so we said, no, nope, if we create our own, then we can more closely control that and give give our permanent team members that time off to be with their families and loved ones on the weekends and on the holidays. So that was one thing we did. We innovated new care delivery models. So we introduced paramedics into our emergency departments. We created something called the RN attending model, which really places an experienced RN at the helm over a pot of patients. So uh, it's an RN, two LPNs, two nurse techs, uh, and they care for 12 patients, but there's more hands to be able to provide care. And what that actually did for us, it allowed us to open additional bed capacity. It increased staff satisfaction. It increased patient satisfaction. It increased physician satisfaction. Our quality mm -hmm. outcomes went up and our costs went down. So that was one of the other models that we did. Um, we created an internal travel pool, which is different than our system-wide premium flex pool because that internal travel pool is a non-benefited position and they work six months out of the year and then have six months off, but they are Cone Health employees. So um, we did that. And then we created our own Cone Health conceptual framework for retention, because it's not enough just to focus on bringing in new staff. You also have to focus in on keeping the staff that you have. And so 
we have now shortened the name for that to the stay map process but that is really action planning in collaboration with our staff on a unit by unit basis to create things that will be meaningful for them to have a healthy work environment. So we've done those things and, and that can be anything like creating a Zen room on the unit, providing snacks, healthy snacks, sometimes unhealthy snacks, depending on the unit <laughs> um, and, and what they want. Um, it can be things like doing social outings outside of work. It just depends on what that particular department wants. And of course, you know, we have continued to do um, compensation enhancements for our team members to make sure that we're staying competitive in the market. One of the things mm -hmm. that was new for Cone Health that I did was create specialty differentials for different areas. And that way, if we ever have to adjust because the market is moving in one particular area, we can adjust that particular area without having to adjust across the board. So it allows our dollars to be used smarter um, and, you know, <clears throat> in a more targeted fashion, if you will. And then yeah. finally, we standardized our shift incentive policy. We had a lot of variation in practice when that came out. So standardizing that process and putting some rigors and protocols in place um, for approving that across departments has really yielded some great financial results. Hmm, okay. So it seems that during COVID, more of the money was going straight into travel nurse agencies. Now you're working a bit more uh, intelligently in how you allocate it and more nuanced way of distributing that. Yeah, that more of the money is going into the pockets of our team and less into the pockets of the agencies, which is what we wanted. You know, we also significantly dropped our rates uh, working with our agency partners. Um, we dropped the rates on our travel nurses, which also yielded significant results because when you don't spend the dollars there, you can reinvest it back into your team, which is where we want it to be. And on those, so the internal flex program and your internal travel program with the nurse, do you think you get a similar amount of pay as they would with a travel agency? Actually, I think our pay is more competitive than the travel agency for our system-wide premium flex pool. Uh, they made a significant rate, plus they had benefits, you know, so there were fully benefited Cone Health team members. Uh, we locked the rate in for two years. Um, and, and so we filled those positions right away. And also with the internal travel pool. So those are non-benefited positions, but they're also a flat rate that's very, very competitive. We had those yeah. positions <clears throat> filled in less than 30 days. And then we also created some flexibility for our own team members, you know, through weekend option positions um, in looking at different types of shifts that people wanted to work. Uh, being able to break full-time FTEs into part-time if people wanted more time with their family. Um, because not everybody wants to continue working the same number of hours. People did not want to pick up overtime and things like that. And so, you know, we really had to be creative in how we uh, created new shifts and new ways of working so that people could have good work-life balance. Yeah. Yes, because you said that creative labor strategies are a main driver of this change. Before we, I'd love to explore that more. Before we move on, you're a nurse yourself. I know a lot of travel nurses got used to the the high demand and the high pay during the pandemic. What would you say to those who feel a bit, I don't know, deflated at the moment now that the rates have come down? So I would say that you know, it was great to take advantage of it while it was there. And I don't think it was realistic for anybody to plan for it to be there. When you look at uh, the amount of the workforce that nursing comprises, 
it's almost half. And so when you have that many employees, you can't pay that number of staff what you would pay a physician, right? You just, that is not something that any organization can afford to do and uh, remain an organization that exists to provide healthcare and well-being to the communities that they serve. So, you know, one thing I was really glad about during the pandemic is that people universally realized the value that nurses bring to healthcare and that nurses were celebrated as a profession. That I think was really great. And um, I, to be honest, I don't think anyone should have gotten used to having those kind of pay rates, if you took advantage of it, I hope you put some aside in your piggy bank so that you, or either got yourself out of debt, paid off your student loans, did whatever with it, uh, save for retirement or college for your kids. That's really what that pool of money would have been for, but not as a sustainable ongoing type of income. So, um, I know that's probably not like an inflating answer, but I, it's an mm -hmm. honest answer. Yeah. Yeah. It can get hard to once you're earning more than you did and then to go back for. Um, but it, one thing that I think that whole increase in spend resulted in was what you mentioned. So more flexible work and then higher pay rate for staff nurses. So let's touch a little bit more on your hiring strategies over the past year or so, what creative methods did you use to attract new nurses to Cone Health who hadn't worked there before? Yeah, so um, so we have a great culture here. So one of the things I would say in all honesty, our travel nurses have spread the word that Cone Health is a great place to work. So that is good. And many of our travel nurses converted to become our own employees. Um, and left their agencies because the work environment was so good. So we definitely filled some of our positions that way. We have great partnerships with all of our local schools. But one of the things I think we've done is we feature our own staff. Like, mm. you know, you go to some organizations and it's like the canned picture of people working, not for us. We use our own team members. We let them use their own words. We've done videos with them. We've done um, virtual hiring events. We do them all around town. Um, we did a meet and greet with all of our leaders, which was very well attended. We had about 200 nurses come attend that outside of our leaders. So um, people are interested now that the money is sort of in a better place. People are more interested in working for a truly good organization where they matter where people care about them, where they have opportunities for professional growth and development. Um, and I think those things are great. One of the things we did over COVID was create an executive nurse leadership academy to allow people the opportunity to gain skills and grow. And so we have four tiers in that. And the first tier is for people who are either are or are aspiring to be um, charge nurses or RN3s, RN4s, which is our clinical ladder program. We have another tier, which is for supervisors, managers, and assistant directors, another tier that's for directors, and another tier that's for people who want to be executive directors or CNOs. And so the curricula is very rich, and, and we really kind of have a competitive process to get into that, but People love opportunities to grow and develop. We give every one of our team members access to LinkedIn learning. I mean, how cool is that? We, so we do that. Um, we have a great professional development and education department. So we offer free CEUs to our staff, all these ways for them um, to grow within our system. And, and that reputation is out there. Right? Not every place does that. We help people go back to school. We help them get certified or recertified and not just with training, but with dollars, right? So there are some of those other um, type of financial perks that maybe don't show up in a salary, but are very much available to people. Um, 
people people love working here. So when we've done that, uh, featured our own staff and utilized them, we have referral bonuses for our own team members. So if they know somebody who they think would be a great fit and somebody that they would want to work with at Cone Health, we reward them with that. Um, so, I, you know, I think all of those type of things, we offer relocation for staff nurses if they're outside of the area and they want to move to come work at Cone Health, which is something you don't see everybody do. Um, so we really take a lot of time to invest in people. And when we share that with people, those are the type of things that draw people to want to work at Cone Health. And the other thing I'll tell you that is an advantage for us is that we're a community health system. And so people who are very dedicated and want to be in service to a community, not everybody wants to work in an academic um, health system. They just don't. And so that community aspect is a real advantage for us, uh, for people who want to be embedded in the community. And of course, we encourage mm -hmm. that. We have inclusion networks, so people can be involved in network across the organization based on their areas of interest, and, and they have an opportunity to get involved in the community. So Cohen Health does a lot of things to support that, but those are some of the things that we've advertised um, as ways to get people in the door. Yeah. I like how you're playing to your strengths in the sense of some organizations that aren't a big academic affiliate health system wouldn't be able to realize that that could be a benefit to some people, as you mentioned, more community focus and feel. So maybe not strengths isn't the right word, but what makes you unique and different is what you're bringing I'll out there. I'll take it as a strength. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, and are nurses here applying and getting hired? Are they saying that's what brought them to the system or are they saying something different? So mostly what we hear from people who come to our system is that they're coming for the culture, that they've heard about us and heard about our reputation from others. And then truly, um, at least a third of every one of my nursing orientations is people who left to go somewhere else because they thought maybe the grass was greener on the other side and they're like, I want to come back home. So a third of our people are people who are coming back to Cone Health on any given orientation. And I think that speaks volumes too when you have all the options available to you. I'm in a really competitive market where I am. Um, you know, I have Novant and Atrium Wake Forest Baptist to my west, to my east, I have Duke and UNC, and to my south, I have Atrium proper. So um, it's really competitive. So you have to pay fairly and competitive, but I, I'm not the highest payer in the market, but I do offer uh, a lot of other things to nurses that are important to them, whether it's flexibility, whether it's, you know, great leaders, uh, within our system who are going to care. We help people grow. Cone Health very much invests in its team members. And so all of those things, uh, we get a lot of word of mouth promotion within our region for people wanting to come here. Yeah, we did a lot of work with Vident Health as they were known back then in North Carolina. Um, find that word of mouth was huge uh, for for that sort of region as well. So I think it's something really to play into and I'm glad to hear that you're doing it successfully. I'd like to flip really onto retention now and talk about uh, one third of nurses are returning back. How do you, how do you make sure that they stay for good and then stop new staff from wanting to leave? Yeah, so I think that stay map process that I referenced, that conceptual framework for retention, we're seeing some really good results from that. So we've had some units that have decreased their turnover by as much as uh, 25 to 30%. And then as an overall enterprise, we've reduced our turnover by 10%. 
And that's just by action planning with our staff, you know, making things easier. So we've done some things. Um, I worked with uh, Kathy Cochran, who is our chief nursing informatics officer, to convene a team to reduce documentation burden for our staff, right? Because when you're out there rounding, people are like, oh, I'm always spending all this time charting, blah, blah, blah. So we're like, how can we make this easier for people? So we convened a team and we just got our data back. We have given every single nurse, every shift, 20 minutes back in documentation time. That's 5.6 days a year that our nurses are not having to spend documenting, that they can either spend finding joy in spending time with their patients and taking a bio break or a lunch break, you know, those type of things where they really can recharge and refresh. Um, I already talked about some of the things we've done, Zen rooms and social outings, snacks, breaks. Um, so some of those things have been really important. I think one of the things that our staff, I would say, as an overall theme across units has talked about is missing that connection piece that didn't always happen during COVID. People were in masks all the time. You couldn't see people's faces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people weren't really able to spend some of that time together. And then really, we have a strong shared governance within our organization. So our staff really have a voice and a say in changes that impact their practice. We don't do any practice changes without our frontline nurses signing off on that. Um, we created a nursing strategic plan, which again, went from our executive leaders to our frontline nurses and leaders and uh, so many, many fingerprints went into creating that nursing strategic plan that we're now executing on. So those are some of the things I think when people feel like they have a voice, they have a say, uh, they have people who listen and care when we round <clears throat> on the units, we are always asking, do you have everything that you need? Sometimes it's easy fixes. It's a piece of equipment that's broken that we can go ahead and get fixed right then and there, right? For some of our staff, it was really around safety issues, right? With workplace violence escalating. So we did things like we brought our different police departments here and we did town halls with our staff and we've instituted weapons detection systems. And, you know, we've done active shooter trainings. We've done a lot of things. Um, to try to help keep people safe because that is one of the things that is a core premise for us. We need people to feel safe when they come to work. And uh, we also want our patients to feel safe too. Mm. But, you know, those are some of the ways in which we've been able to retain our team members. And then also, like I said, that financial investment in their growth and development for anyone who wants to do it. But even if they don't want to move beyond the position where they are, we have committees and things for them to be able to plug in to grow in place if that's really what they desire. So we do something called iCompass conversations where we meet individually several times a year with each staff member and we really find out what's important to them. What are their goals and how can we help them achieve their goals? So those are the things that kind of help keep people. Yeah, that personalized relationship is crucial. I find in all our work that those who recognize that nurses are individuals, not just a body or workers really can show them that they care. And that's what people are crying out for. Nurses care for others all day. And I think Generally in healthcare, a lot feel like they're not being cared for by health systems or or others. So I love that you are you're considering that, and that probably comes from you, with uh, your your influence and your nursing experience. So you touched upon safety, and I've found that to be something top of mind for many at the moment. Partly 
driven by news stories you see about assaults or attacks in or outside a unit. But it's hard for nurses to understand how much is going on, particularly on a a local level. And it brings us on to metrics. How would you track how see if nurses feel at your facility or how do you track if you're meeting those iCompass objectives or some of the metrics that you could use? Yeah, so for iCompass, we definitely track whether they're completed or not. We do them three times a year, sometimes four. Um, So we track that and we track any leader who uh, hasn't had those conversations and there is follow up behind that. Um, In terms of safety, we absolutely, so one, we ask the questions, right? We ask it on rounds. We ask it um, in our employee engagement and our AHRQ safety survey. So we asked directly about safety um, to hear right from the staff, like, are you feeling safer, right? We just instituted, we use um, HealthStream as our electronic learning platform. So currently, right now, we have uh, an HLC that's assigned to people and it's around workplace violence. And at the end of that, there's a survey that you have to answer and it's all about safety. So we have um, pretty close to 6,000 responses at this point. And there's some really good, easy, actionable information that we're gonna take and start implementing some of the feedback directly from our staff. Um, But those are some of the things we also look at um, patient on staff assaults Mm -hmm. and assaults with injury. We also look at, um, you know, our incident reporting system to see what has been put in there. We uh, implemented some new uh, initiatives around psychological safety so really we're teaching people how to cuss appropriately at Cone Health <laughs> um, to say, I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, this is a safety issue. And then we take it a step further and empower our staff to stop the line. So whoever, whoever it is, if they are not comfortable, they have the opportunity to stop the line right then and there and everything will stop. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that we've implemented. We're getting ready to launch some town halls to talk about all of the things that we've done. We have a workplace violence committee uh, that's pretty robust. And we just instituted um, a workplace, uh, an employee advocate, if you will. So if somebody does get injured on the job through a workplace violence um, event, that somebody will walk them through step by step. You know, we had to do things. We we did have to meet with our local law enforcement because uh, there there was the perception out there for whatever reason that our staff couldn't file charges. So we brought them in and we were like, mm-hmm. okay, how do we file charges? Is this true? Is this what's being said to our staff? So it actually resulted in a really good dialogue where there was two way education, law enforcement was taking information back to their team. And we also found some of our own internal processes that we needed to um, beef up, if you will, and, and revamp and tweak a bit. So, uh, you know, of course, we utilize cameras and things like that. People have personal panic buttons that they can use that prompt a security response. So, um, lots of different ways we use de-escalation training star training in certain areas if people have to take anybody down so um a lot of things have been put in place to try to help people feel safe and to equip them to be safe yeah most of those are trackable as well so Mm -hmm. that's certainly impressive and to kind of look ahead metrics again will be informed a lot of this but looking ahead to this year what are some of the the challenges that you're you're working on for this year and 
some plans to overcome them? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're obviously still working very diligently on recruiting because we haven't filled all of our vacancies and that is our goal. So we're definitely working diligently on that um, and finding new ways. We're looking at uh, spreading and implementing uh, more of our RN attending model across the organization. We implemented virtual nursing as an added layer of support with so many new nurses entering in the profession. Virtual nursing really gives us a way to extend the life of some of our more seasoned nurses uh, and provide additional support to our newer nurses and allow that knowledge transfer to take place so they have an instant mentor after their precepting is finished. And that is going swimmingly. People love it so far. So we're tracking obviously the quality and safety outcomes on the unit, but we're also looking at our ability to recruit and retain staff. As part of that, we're obviously tracking our premium labor spend, both in contract nurses and in shift incentives. Um, and then we're tracking our satisfaction, our employee engagement and satisfaction results. So I'm proud to say that we did the RN survey questions on this last go round. We got the results last month and we improved statistically significantly on every single one of those questions. So those are things I think that are, that are helpful. I hold a monthly town hall along with all of the site CNOs for our staff every month so that any staff member across the system can join that and they can ask anything that's on their mind and they can hear updates from around the system. So that's just gone really well. And then there's a newsletter that I started that gets sent out to all of our team members too, where we really celebrate and highlight the work uh, that our team is doing, because I think it's important to celebrate those good things. You know. No problem. Everybody's going to hear when something isn't going the right way, but you've got to let people know when it is going the right way and highlight the innovations that are happening in nursing. Like We have a group of nurses who created a very savvy product and, it, and it's cheap. They make it themselves. But um, to be able to allow mastectomy patients to be able to take a shower. So it holds their, their drains and things so that they can go in the shower. Our patients love it. Our staff created it, yeah. you know? Um, so some of those things that you can highlight for people that aren't necessarily a, a metric, I think it's important to have both the quantitative and the qualitative information to be able to share with people uh, because both are important. Yeah. Sounds like you've got the knack for storytelling and you're able to share what's happening, but in a, in, I don't know, in an enticing way and also give nurses the forum to do the same themselves. So um, I really get a sensation from you that you're really close to what nurses want and you're working on improving it every day. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us. Um, if yeah, if anybody wants to reach out, how can they get in touch with you? Oh yeah, the best way is through email. It's um, v-i-a-n-n-e dot a-n-t-r-u-m at conehealth.com. Um, and I really appreciate you having me on here, Adam, and allowing me to share some of the great work that my team and I have done at Cohen Health to help contribute to the $100 million turnaround that we had here. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, thanks for coming on. So if you'd like to follow our podcast, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to learn more about what we do here at Nurse Recruitment Experts and you're listening in, you can reach me on LinkedIn. We hope you reach 10 times more nurses than through the job boards through our social platform. So Reach out to me or reach out to Vi if you'd like to connect more. And um, once more, thank you very much for coming on. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.